<clears throat> All right. So it is three o'clock on uh, Friday, April 24th. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this rainy afternoon. Um, as many of you know, this has been a full week of what we call virtual Patriot Day activities. Um, Patriot Day was a little different this year. The spring of 2020, I'm sure, will be remembered for a long time for the way that things changed. Um, all the physical gatherings, all the events that normally are so emblematic of Patriot Day, things like the reenactments, the parades, obviously all of those were a big threat to public health and safety. Um, so the town of Lexington and <clears throat> the town of Concord and Minuteman National Historical Park made the tough decision, and, and the Historical Society, made the tough decision to cancel a lot of the physical gatherings that were happening, uh, that would normally happen during the week of Patriots Day. However, both the park and us and Monroe Center for the Arts and a few other local organizations have worked very hard to bring programming um, to visitors to our social media, our website, um, throughout the country and throughout the world. So hopefully you've been tuning in. Um, I'll mention now that we just, as of an hour or two ago, made sure that all the recordings of the past programs from this week are now on our Patriot Day page on our website, which is lexingtonhistory.org backslash Patriot Day. I will drop the link in the chat window before this is over. Um, but if you go to that link, there are a lot of tiles with images. All of the programs as of today, when we finish up here, have been completed. Um, and it is a recorded version of the programs um, that you'll be linking to. Um, they will stay on the Patriot State page for now. They also may end up migrating to our newly created digital content page, um, lexingtonhistory.org backslash digital content. Um, after a week or two, probably we'll migrate those over there and they will live up there for a while. Um, in case you're wondering, I'm also uh, our outreach manager. I'm Stacey Fraser, as I should have mentioned way at the beginning. Um, but I am our collections and outreach manager. So not only do I get to take care of these really cool objects um, and also take care of our uh, documents and photographs and books with uh, our archives manager, Elizabeth Muberick, but as outreach manager, I get to share these beautiful objects and all of our events and programs. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat window um, or the Q&A window. Uh, it's just me here due to social distancing concerns. So I am going to check uh, the chat windows between each object that I talk about. And if you have questions about that specific object, um, then I can answer them in between. Uh, I'm not sure how long we'll go today, but as I said, the recording when it is finished will be available on our website. Um, internet connection is pretty good here. I'm at the new archives and research center at Monroe Tavern. Um, we have a great connection normally, but it's a rainy day and everything is kind of off these days. So if there's any issues with the network connection, just hang in and we'll reconnect as soon as we can. We is apparently me and the mouse in my pocket, Lexi, because as I said, I'm the only one here. But in the interim, um, as you can see behind me, this is our new Archives Research Center. It's a thing that we were supposed to be opening at the end of this month. Um, we are very pleased the building is done. We are anxious and excited to show it to people. Uh, we are not going to be able to do that for a while, we think, but in the interim, at least, you can get a little glimpse of it here. This is the second floor collections workspace. So we have a space downstairs for uh, archives volunteers to process items. We also have this space up here with a work table for collections focused volunteers to work on things. Um, as you can see behind us, we have rare books, lots of things on open shelving, textile boxes over here. You can't see to the left. Um, and it's a really wonderful thing to have this space to be able to do this kind of a program. So without further ado, uh, we're going to get started. We are going to start with the largest object first. Um, this one is an object that we are presenting today in part because it is an object that you don't see regularly. Um, we have so many objects in our collection that are related to the Revolutionary War, in particular the first couple of days of it. Um, because as you all know, it happens in our town. <laughs> um, we're very lucky as an organization, as a historical society, we were founded in 1886. And given that that was only 111 years after the battles of Lexington and Concord, um, many, many people still had access to their 
ancestors uh, muskets or powder horns or something that they carried uh, that day, uh, everyone was very aware of how important the Battle of Lexington Battles of Lexington and Concord, excuse me, uh, was or were, and so everyone saved things. So we were very lucky at the very beginning of our founding, we had a lot of items that were donated, items, documents, etc., that were donated that had a really direct connection to the American Revolution and to the first couple of dates. Um, we are going to present three items today uh, that are slightly less seen. Uh, two of these objects, to my knowledge, have never been on display. Um, one of these objects has been, but not in a physical way, a photograph of this object was one of, in one of our CVS windows, uh, one of those exhibits in 2017, I believe. So we'll look at these three objects, um, but as I said, we have a lot of other American Revolution objects and documents and photographs. Um, the photographs obviously would be of items you know, from that time period, uh, but we do have prints. We have things like the Doolittle prints. Um, which we're not presenting today, but in concert with this program, our archives manager, Elizabeth Newbrick, and I have worked on a uh, slideshow presentation showing a lot of our objects that are April 19th um, adjacent or directly related to. Um, and we'll be finishing up the final details on that and, and publishing that um, within the next week or so. Um, and it'll also contain a lot of links. It does cover the three objects we're going to talk about today. So it contains links, for, it will contain links for more information about those objects. So again, without further ado, we're going to start over here um, with this pretty cool object. It is called the Hayward Pump. Now, when we were moving our collections objects last year, we moved everything into, excuse me, two years ago at this point, we moved everything into Monroe Tavern so that we could have this building professionally and safely built and the collections could be safe inside the historic house. That's why we were closed um, in 2018 at Monroe. Um, and this was one object that we ended up moving from the basement up into the second floor to our new furniture vault on the second floor. And we definitely had no idea what it was at first. Um, it's one of those collections objects that is not immediately apparent. Uh, you can see we have a lever here um, so there's a pretty good chance that's intended to go up and down, which you can kind of see. <clears throat> it's a wooden post, um, but if you look inside, you can see that it is hollow. Seems a little weird, right? A hollow wooden post. Um, and then you start to put two and two together and realize that early plumbing involved wooden pipes. Um, there are examples at museums like Strawberry Bank um, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, showing wooden pipes that used to be used for the conveyance of water before modern plumbing. So there's the water connection. This pump stood on top of a well on the Fisk property, the Ebenezer Fisk farm, which was kind of on the border of Lexington and Lincoln. And it sat atop a well there. It was what they used to, you know, pump the water up um, for use. It was a witness. We talk about witness houses in Lexington, all the houses around the Battle Green. Um, those were all buildings that saw, that witnessed um, battle, that witnessed large, important historical events. Witness houses are something we have here in Lexington, but also are throughout the country. In this case, we're talking about yet another uh, witness object, for lack of a better term. If anybody has a better term than witness objects, let me know in the chat and we'll see if we can uh, copyright something today. <laughs> uh, so this object is a witness object. It was on the well on the Fisk property. This is during the battle, uh, during the later part of the day when the British have received a pretty good solid defeat at Old North Bridge and they are starting the retreat back to Boston. <clears throat> As many of you know, probably before this week, uh, in some of the programs we talked about this week, we covered how the retreat from Concord to Boston was basically a half marathon of gunfire. Um, it was a very, very difficult and um, upsetting situation. And a lot of things happened where people weren't just firing at a line of other soldiers, where it was a very direct one-on-one -on -one connection when, um, when they were fighting. And this is a witness object to that uh, kind of a situation, to a very human story. Um, the story goes that James Hayward, who was a militia member uh, from Acton, Massachusetts, um, obviously, as, as again many of you know, um, the response 
to the British uh, incursion into the countryside on April 19th was not just uh, the men from Lexington, the men from Concord. Uh, there were men from Acton uh, at Old North Bridge, and they were, uh, there were militia troops from a lot of surrounding towns that poured into this area um, after the battles of Lexington and Concord and contributed, um, not just the day of, but also later on. So we have this Acton militiaman, James Hayward. He arrives at the Fisk Farm at the well at the same time and comes up to this pump at the same time as a British soldier arrives. And as a historian, it's really difficult to conjecture. You don't want to put words in people's mouths. Uh, the story that has gone with that incident involved the two soldiers, the militia soldier Hayward and the British soldier who we do not know the name of, to my knowledge. If I'm wrong about that, if someone has done research about that and has the name of the British soldier, please drop it in the chat window um, and we will, all, we will all learn. And they faced each other, both looking for water. They both come to the well because it was a long day. They were fighting. It was clear that day. It was sunny. So it being April, you know, it's a little cooler, but it's certainly if you're marching many, many miles and didn't necessarily expect to march this many miles, the British weren't really expecting this to be an extended expedition then you need something to fill up your flask. You need some water or just to, you know, scoop into your mouth, you need water. So the two of them arrive at the same time and they are looking at each other and they both want the water, but it's in between them. So according, again, not putting words in people's mouths, but according to the story that goes with this, um, Hayward says, or excuse me, the British soldier says to Hayward, you're a dead man. And Hayward says back, and so are you. And they both fire at the same time. Uh, the musket ball that hits the British soldier takes his life um, at, the, at that moment, and Hayward is mortally wounded um, and does not survive either. So, it's a pretty amazing story, and the connection, I think, that we find later on between the paper records and the physical object is where it really kicks in, because having something like this, an old water pump in the collection is wonderful. As I said before, it tells us about water pipes. It tells us about some interesting early plumbing facts. It's interesting, but it's the connection on this one. This object saw things, <laughs> for lack of a you know, better term for an inanimate, inanimate object. This pump saw this thing happen um, and it became a well-known site. The story spread, there are many stories, some myths, some legends, some fully true, but just extraordinary about uh, what happened on April 19th. And this physical object became part of that story. So the object stayed for quite a long time where it was. Um, that we have photographs and postcards from the late 19th and early 20th century showing the pump um, on location on the Fisk farm over the well. Um, after Minuteman National Park um, was established in the 1950s, um, the park owned the land and the park put up a marker. Um, that was actually a little bit earlier on that the park put up the marker, but there is a current one from, from NPS now that tells the story of James Hayward. Um, the site still exists. That's something I will drop in the comments when we uh, do our presentation, our, our slideshow presentation <coughs> that we will put out. Um, the site's still there, you can go and look at it, but the pub is here. Um, the really interesting thing about objects sometimes is the provenance. Where does this come from? Why do we have it? Um, this one is really, really tricky because we don't have a good record. Our early accession records, our records that we uh, write down information when something comes into our collection, were early on, they were stored in books, you know, pre-computers, pre uh, pre-typewriters, pre any of that in the 1880s and 90s when we first started collecting, all this information um, was in books. And unfortunately, the record that we have for this one basically just said uh, old water pump, tag says Hayward pump. So we don't have the information that we want as far as how it got from the Fisk farm into our collections, but we're glad that it did. Um, we are obviously a good repository for something like that and we're very, very pleased to have it. Um, it's also a very unusual object. It'd be difficult to display. Um, it's not something that I can have people touching. There's some sharp, jagged wooden edges at the top here. Um, this is very likely tin, but it could be lead, um, part of why I haven't touched it directly. An interesting note about gloves for today. Um, normally collections managers, curators, anyone working in a field where you're touching 
historic objects, documents, photographs, etc. Normally, we would use something called nitro gloves. Um, they're very common with healthcare workers. Um, and they replace these white cotton gloves that were used for a little while. Um, they've sort of become a symbol of, of collections care and object handling, but in fact, these type of gloves, the white cotton, are not as good for handling objects as nitro gloves are. That being said, in 2020, as we know, everything is different. And we had nitro gloves that we donated with some of our other face masks and personal protective equipment to a local hospital. So for today, we're using these. <laughs> they don't hurt the objects, they're just not as good for them. Um, we are probably not going to lift this one up because it's pretty heavy and that wouldn't be safe, but I did want to at least turn it a little so that you guys can see it better. You can see the hole in here where there would have been a faucet or spigot. The pump over here, the pump handle, excuse me. Um, and yeah, the, this is probably, as I said, could be uh, tin, might be lead. <clears throat> this looks like copper uh, bands. It's almost like a barrel, the way you make a barrel, you know, with bands sort of holding in um, the curved wood. Um, yeah, that's copper. Um, and part of the reason why we're so interested in this object and why we decided to talk about it today uh, was because we did a battle damage program with a local military expert called, uh, named Joel Bowie on Monday. And Joel had recently visited the Acton Memorial Library. As I mentioned, James Hayward was from Acton. And when the British soldier fired on him that morning, the, uh, and, and who knows, this may have been why he didn't die right away at the well as the soldier did, as the British soldier did. But he had his powder horn, he was carrying his powder horn on him, and the musket ball went through the powder horn. Um, so again, he was mortally wounded, he did die, but I do sort of wonder if the powder horn provided a little bit of a cushion um, on the impact of the ball, and um, he didn't die um, as quickly because of it. Again, not sure that's a blessing um, in this situation with pretty rudimentary medicine. Um, but the powder horn itself still survives and is at Acton Memorial Library. So that's another link that we'll uh, put into the document about this pump. Um, you can actually see photographs and go see the Acton Memorial Library's um, special collections and see the photograph of the powder horn with, you know, a big section broken out of it. So a really cool connection. We love when our collections relate to collections in other museums. Um, so we can work together on things, we can cross promote, we can tell a fuller story for the items that we have in each individual collection. All right, we're moving on to the next object. So I'm gonna do a quick check to see if anyone has any questions. Nothing so far, like I said, please, uh, we're gonna drop some more information at you later, but if you have questions specifically about one of these objects, please try to do it right afterwards so I can check in between. Um, I'll try to answer some final questions at the end as well. So moving on to our next object. We have this guy here, this wooden post. I will show you. Um, this one doesn't have any metal on it, which would be the primary reason for wearing gloves normally to protect my hands from what might be um, an older metal with um, some safety concerns. But it's also to protect the objects themselves from the oil on my hands, on human hands. Um, you, the best way to handle collections objects really is with clean, dry hands, but if you can't do that or if you're especially concerned about transfer from your hands to the object or the object to your hands, then gloves are the way to go. Uh, this post here, I'm going to lift up for just a minute. I don't want to damage it. This item here is probably kind of hard to see, but you can see it is a wooden post. This object doesn't look very exciting to start with, does it? This is like many other objects in our collection that aren't physically exciting. <laughs> they are not a beautiful embroidery. They are not a beautiful painting. They are not an amazing photograph. They are a wood fragment. However, this one was part of a post that was on deck on the British Man of War, Somerset. Again, another one of those really amazing objects that we would love to know the provenance of. We would love to know how this object came into our collection. We do not know. We may eventually find out by doing further research. Um, it is possible sometimes we have family members whose ancestor um, gave us an object in the 
you know, late 1900s, um, excuse me, early 1900s, uh, late uh, 1800s, and they'll write to us later and say, hey, my family member gave this to you, do you still have it? And that's actually wonderful because we can say, oh yes, we do, and we didn't know where it was from. So thank you, let's get this, you know, written down. We don't know where this one came from. Um, we may never know, but it is from the Man of War, the ship that the British had in Boston Harbor. If any of you remember the Longfellow poem, of course, Paul Revere is rowing past the Somerset um, and her, you know, uh, I'm going to mess up the line because I haven't done this in a really long time, but basically the um, masts and spars uh, from the ship are laying across the moonlight like prison bars. Anyone remembers that line? And this is a post from that ship. Um, it's a Samson post, which I will do a quick share screen. If any of you are um, not handy like I am, let me see if I can get this up. There we go. There's a Samson post, if everyone can see that. Um, it's basically just a post that sticks up on the deck of a ship with something that sticks out on either side, um, a, a rod through there, and you can tie off uh, ropes and things like that too. So nothing too, too complicated. Um, just a simple post uh, from the ship, but we have it. Um, and as I said, in addition to being there for the, um, the night of the 18th when Revere's riding past it, uh, the Somerset also took part in the British uh, bombardment, the bombardment of Charlestown, sort of helping to or attempting to clear the way for the British troops at the Battle of Bunker Hill to have more success by bombarding Charlestown in advance. Um, the Somerset herself um, was wrecked in the sandbar off Provincetown, Massachusetts in 1778. And so that's partly why I imagine we got this object. Um, it must have been recovered from the shipwreck and somehow made it up here. Um, it's another object that makes sense in Lexington, but also makes sense in other historical institutions. So we try to share that information with others as much as we can. Does anyone have any questions about the post? I guess not. All right, that's okay. <laughs> um, my email address I can drop um, in the chat window later on. It's sfraser at lexingtonhistory.org. So I can leave that there if you think of a question or, or some information you want to share about any of these objects or things we talked about today. Um, please do uh, shoot me an email. All right, so that's the post, that's the pump. The next object, really excited about. <clears throat> not gonna wear gloves for the next object because it's not dirty and my hands are clean and dry. <clears throat> this one's really fun. One of the things that I think people really like to look at for Rev War soldiers is their powder horn. Powder horns were very personal. Um, if you were a member of the militia, um, if you were someone who hunted for food, if you were anyone who carried a musket with you in the 18th century, you needed to have black powder with you as well. One of the easiest and most convenient and mobile ways to carry black powder, remember again, we're talking about a time before you get really good sealing little glass jars, we're way before Tupperware, we're way before any kind of a container that would hold powder really well. Baskets don't do a great job with that. Um, cartridge boxes, you know, they hold cartridges really well. Once the cartridges are made, it's powder inside the cartridge, but just the loose powder, it's difficult to get something to hold it well. And one thing that does is a powder horn. Um, so I always joke with people when they ask how many powder horns we have, or do we have a lot of powder horns in our collection? Because this here is an entire box full of powder horns. <laughs> we literally have this many. Um, I will check to see, I believe we have at least 10 powder horns in this box. Um, we have a couple of other powder horns in other uh, collections. Um, and in other boxes, but lots of powder horns. <laughs> People don't know what to do with them after a certain point. They're very uh, nice to have, but we have a lot of different ones. We have ones that are large, ones that are small. Um, we have some that were very small, were kind of designed almost as decorative uniform ones for a lot of the centennial parading and things that were done to celebrate um, the battle much later. So 1875, the centennial times like that, there were a lot of like the Minutemen Company was founded then. There was a lot of ceremonial um, parades and things they would do and some of them had sort of decorative um, powder horns. We have a small powder horn that belonged to um, a young boy who used to have a, a uniform that he would wear as a member of the group uh, in the 1870s. 
Um, but as I said, Powderhorn's a very personal object. You carry it with you. It carries something that's absolutely vital to what you're doing. Um, it needs to be protected carefully because as many of you know, black powder is, is very volatile. Um, you need to be very well trained um, in order to, to be responsible for it. You need to keep it safe. So powder horns do a really good job for that. Um, mostly in this part of the country, the horns are coming from cattle, from oxen, um, cows, things like that. There are other parts of the country where the powder horns might come from elk um, or larger animals. Um, this one we believe is probably ox horn. Um, the caveat for this one is that it is by far the coolest object in our collection, I have to say, but that is a very subjective personal decision. I'll show you more in a second, but the designs that are carved on this object were so important to me personally that I got them carved, well, tattooed on my arm. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, there are, there's a personal connection to this object that makes it really significant. Um, this one I'm going to bring up close so you guys can see closely. Uh, this is the powder horn of a gentleman named Reuben Locke, <clears throat> with an E on the end. Reuben was from Lexington. Um, Reuben was born in March of 1748 and died in January of 1823. This was his horn. He carved this horn with all these decorations. A lot of them are folk art. There's some daisy wheels and some sort of um, mostly English style folk uh, carvings on here. Um, this is the you know plug sort of at the end here um, with a hole used for pouring. This is another plug here. This is a wooden plug at the end. And I don't know if the angle is good enough that you all can see this, but Carved into it are the initials RL and the letter 1766. Now here's the tricky thing about dating an object like this. Uh, dating objects is something that's very important to us because we want to get a sense of when something is from. If this was a powder horn that we were able to date to a much earlier or much later date than 1775, it would give us more information. Um, that being said, it's tricky when objects have removable parts. This is a perfect example. We've always said that uh, this plug with the 1766 date, it gives us a pretty good sense that this is probably, he probably made this powder horn around 1766. Okay. However, the plug does come out, you know, it's removable. We don't take it out obviously, but it's removable. So it's also possible that the plug could have been done a, a different time and added to this horn. Um, it's obviously a very snug fit. It is very neatly all the way around the object. So it's clearly made for this object in particular. <clears throat> but again, that being said, we don't know for sure if this removable piece that says 1766 gives us a date of creation for the horn, or if the horn had been used by Locke far earlier and the plug put on in 1766. Regardless, it's an amazing object, and it is so cool because it tells us a little bit more about the person. Um, Locke, as I said, was um, born in 1723. Um, he was the son of Stephen Locke and Mahitable Raymond, and he was with the detachment of Captain Parker's company from Lexington, who marched to Cambridge um, May 6th in 1775. He served with John Bridges Company in Roxbury in 1776, uh, then he went on a ship and was taken prisoner. in Dartmoor Prison. Um, it's really exciting if you actually look up Reuben Locke and Dartmoor Prison. There is a journal that was written some, by someone during time in Dartmoor Prison at the same time. For a little while, uh, scholars associated with it thought that it was Locke's, um, but in closer reading, I believe it's been proven to have been another of his fellow prisoners. That being said, it also gives us a sense of what being in a, you know, Siemens prison, um, in 1777 or 1778 or 79 was like. 
Um, so certainly the idea of carving things into your powder horn, carving engravings or interesting things into your powder horn as a way to pass the time in prison resonates, I think, um, and makes a lot of sense. Um, I almost sort of wonder, we are all not in prison right now because of this virus, but we are certainly, I think a lot of us, home more than we'd like to be. So anyone who's taken up a craft project or picked up an old object that they had and decided to jazz it up a little, Ruben Locke would totally understand where you're coming from. And I'm guessing you can probably understand his perspective too. As I said, it's a very cool object. It's really got some interesting carvings. I could talk about it for a really long time. Um, my tattoo artist was very excited to do it. Um, we actually talked about doing just the designs as they were, so imperfect, or doing them sort of perfectly drawn. And in the end, we decided to do them imperfectly because a lot of the appeal of this object is the fact that it was hand done in possibly fairly um, unique circumstances. Uh, so a lot of the carvings have scratches and things that maybe didn't go exactly, you know, the way that was intended. There's also natural wear and tear on the horn itself um, that would have contributed to some of the designs not being perfect. So in the end, that's what um, actually I went with as well. So there's a lot of these scratches and things that are on the horn that are also on my arm. So um, my coworkers, the other staff here at the Historical Society laughed at me a little bit in good fun when I filled out an image permissions form to translate these to my arm. Um, but that's something we do if, if anybody else wants to make a tattoo of the Ruben Lock powder horn. Um, that's how we do it. If you have an image in the collections that you're interested in using for something, um, we can just go ahead and have you submit a form. Um, if it's nonprofit use, which it would be unless you're trying to sell your body, that's a whole other thing, um, then it's a free, a free use. Um, so if you want to make a tattoo out of one of our images, you let us know. <laughs> um, we've covered three main objects here. It's about 3.30. Does anyone have any questions specifically about anything we've talked about so far? Doesn't look like there's too many questions so far coming up in the chat window, which is totally fine. As I said, if people are not feeling it right now, it's a rainy afternoon, so we can just go with what we've got. I did want to take a minute to tell you a little bit more about how to access more of our collections. As I mentioned, our Rev War collections are very extensive. Um, we have probably somewhere around, I'd say upwards of 18,000 individual objects in our collections database. Um, physical objects like these here, and also uh, documents, photographs, books, that sort of thing. At this point, we have uploaded about 8% of our objects to our online collections uh, website. It's accessible um, on our website, but I will drop yet again that link into the chat as well. And a few of our April 19th collection objects are up there. There are nine objects um, that are up there um, for the April 19th collection, mostly documents um, that our, our archives manager Elizabeth Moodwork has put up. Some other objects are up there that have a relationship to April 19th, but we are, as I said, working hard on that. It's at 8% right now. Um, we're gonna keep plugging away and seeing how much we can get up there, but our priority is collections that are important to um, local researchers and others. And obviously our April 19th related objects are very important to all of us. Um, so some of those will be highlighted in the presentation that I will send around afterwards or post afterwards. Um, and some of those are, you know, items that um, we're still working on or that may be available online at some point. Um, but we do have really, really extensive collections in this area. And so that's something that we are happy to talk to people about. New discoveries. Michelle Kane has a good question. Um, new discoveries about specific objects or new objects that have come to the fore? Um, let's see. All right, Michelle, you ponder on that about, oh, new objects. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have, we're always getting, we're always interested in accepting things that have something to do with April 19th. Um, there are, there's nothing that has been donated in the last year or so that is very directly related besides one particular collection. Um, this is a collection that I did not bring the pieces of with me, um, so we can't talk about it right now, but 
We were very, very lucky to have a small collection of objects donated to us by a local man um, who was at the time terminally ill and unfortunately has since passed. Uh, but he was a descendant of Dr. Joseph Fisk Jr. Uh, Dr. Joseph Fisk was the local doctor in Lexington in 1775. He treated many of the men who were wounded that day. He even treated one of the British soldiers at Buckman Tavern. Uh, we have in our collection a receipt uh, or an invoice actually from Dr. Fisk to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the care of the British soldier. Um, I guess on the assumption on his part that the Commonwealth would be the people to pay versus the town and certainly not the British soldier's family or the Commonwealth government, the British government, uh, for that medical care. Um, see, there's always issues with insurance and who's going to pay what. <laughs> not something that's at all new to us. Um, but Fisk himself, as I said, treated all those people. His son, Dr. Joseph Fisk Jr., received a lot of the medical equipment uh, from his father. We have a scale that was donated by this gentleman who is the descendant of Joseph Fisk Jr. We have a, a medical scale for weighing things. We have an inoculation knife, um, which is pretty terrifying. Um, I'm not sure I would want um, a small amount of poison to be put on that, or not poison, of bacteria to be put on that knife and then cut into my skin. But as we know from the smallpox um, pandemic uh, or epidemic that was going on in Boston in the 18th century, that the inoculation, um, the early inoculation that was practiced actually did have a good effect. And, as we know, it was sort of an early um, proto-vaccination uh, tool. So we have an inoculation knife for him. We have two beautiful chairs uh, from Dr. Fis Joseph Fisk Jr.'s family. Um, so that's a wonderful new collection that we just received fairly recently. Um, we're very excited to, to display those objects um, as we get more open. Um, and if anyone else has a question, ah, a question from Paul F. Um, do you anticipate displaying all the powder horns anytime soon? It's a really good question. I would love to. I think that would be super fun. As I said, because they're such personal objects to people, I think it would be really neat to do something like that. Um, the question is where and when and how. Um, we, here in this building, the New Archives and Research Center, directly below me is a beautiful reading room. It's a space that we plan to have uh, people to come in and do research. Um, we have our browsing library. And we have four exhibit cases that we would like to use to create small exhibits that are focused. Um, so whether it's samplers or shoes or powder horns, um, they're small spaces that we can create a little exhibit. People who come into the research center for programs or for doing research can view them. And we can do what we always do with our social media and we, we can take photographs and share those exhibits on our social media and on our website. So yes, if we, in the few coming, you know, few months, if we end up doing um, an exhibit in the smaller cases of the powder horns or samplers or shoes or anything like that, um, we will share them to social media and to our website um, due to the current situation with everyone else, um, everyone actually working from home um, who can. Obviously we are not open and we won't have people physically viewing these objects for a while, but we do have the ability to share them virtually, which we're really, really pleased about. Um, let's see if there's any more questions. Are you ever given objects that you don't know their history for? That's a great question, Meredith. So um, absolutely 110%. Um, we try not to accept those objects unless we can avoid it. It's really important, as you can probably tell from the fact that we don't know who gave us the Hayward Cup. We don't know who gave us the Samson Post from the Somerset. As much as possible, when we accept a new object, we want to know that the person giving it to us has the legal right to do so. There's a lot of copyright issues that come along when you don't have the legal right to give something away, um, especially if we want to use it in things like our social media, our website, publications, things like that. It's really important to make sure copyright is secure. Um, Object copyright is a little different from photographic copyright, document copyright, things like that. But um, we definitely do get objects that the history is a little fuzzy and those are, those are problematic. We really encourage people to come and talk to us. One of the beautiful things about the gentleman who gave us the Joseph Fist Jr. collection is that he is local and he is very well organized, was very well organized and brought in these objects and spent probably an hour or more with us talking about how these objects came to their family, what the importance was, showed us as best he could the full family tree, the connection from him, the donor, all the way back to the user, to Joseph Fitz Jr. So that kind of thing is 
hugely helpful when we have that context. But yes, we do sometimes get things in, in current times that don't have a good history. And we are constantly looking at objects in our collection and saying, you know, we really don't have a strong sense of where this came from, how it came to our collection. Uh, further research can sometimes um, elucidate that or illuminate that a little, but not always. So that's why it's best to get the information from the donor um, as soon as it comes. And it also gives donors a chance to tell us more about their family and for us to talk with them about how their family objects will be well cared for. Um, something that this new Archives and Research Center has given us a wonderful uh, opportunity to do to take care of the objects really well. I think I see a couple more questions and then we will start to wind up. No, I think we're doing good. Um, if anyone has any final questions, go ahead and drop, drop them into the chat window there. Um, this has been really fun. Um, internet didn't go out on us at all, which is really exciting. Um, <clears throat> this is our last program for Virtual Patriots Day. Uh, if you've joined us for previous events during this week, we really appreciate you joining us and celebrating this tradition in a slightly unusual way. Um, if anyone saw the uh, news um, on Sunday, we had a little spot talking about how important Patriot State is to both Lexington residents, but also to we think the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and to a lot of people in other countries. Um, it's a really important day for us because we celebrate um, a very brave stand that was taken that day. Um, and I think it's really important when we can still do something like this, we can still do a program um, where we're sharing information with visitors that everyone can enjoy the tradition despite that. Um, as I said, our Patriot Day programming it was all listed on our website, lexingtonhistory.org backslash Patriot's Day. Um, and now, and as of maybe a half an hour from now, once this recording is ready and I post it, all the recordings of the programs we did this week will be available on that page um, for the next couple of weeks. And then we'll migrate them to our digital content page after that. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, it's been a labor of love um, and very, very interesting, um, uh, very interesting to do this program um, and to create these programs. Uh, we did have one final question there I just wanted to tackle, which was Beth Levine, do you ever rotate the objects in the historic houses with items from the collection? It's a really good question. Our historic houses, Hancock Clark House, Monroe Tavern, Buckman Tavern, they've all been renovated in the last 12 years. Hancock Clark was 2008, um, Monroe was 2010-2011, and Buckman was about 2013-2014. So at that time, our previous collections manager and previous director looked at the objects that had been in the house and said, let's make a really conscious decision to have the furnishings of each house focus as much as possible on April 19, 1775 so that visitors can come in and get a really real sense of this might have been what this house looked like at that time. So furnishings, you know, whether it's physical furnishings or decorative objects, everything in the houses is as close as we can to 1775. Because of that, we don't do a lot of swapping. Um, we have two exhibit cases, one at Buckman, one at, um, sorry, one at Buckman, one at Monroe here that have objects directly related to April 19th and those are in exhibit cases there on display. Um, so it's it's a little bit like they're set the way they are, they work with the experience right now. Um, that being said, being on display for a really long time is not good for objects, documents, anything, for any museum collections. Um, we also have items that we have had on display as an organization for far too long and they were removed from display. A perfect example of that is here at this house, we had a musket that belonged to one of the Monroe cousins, not the Monroes who lived here at this house, but a cousin um, who was fighting on the battle green. And he double loaded. He put two balls into his musket. Um, easy to do in the heat of battle. You can't remember if you've already put the ball down or not, or you're distracted by something going on or being shot at. Um, and he double loaded the musket. And when he shot the musket, it blew off about a third of the barrel. We have that musket. It's very cool. The story is amazing. Um, our tour guides love to tell it. Our visitors love the story. All that being said, though, the musket was on display for, we think, at least probably 60 years, um, which is not good. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of UV light coming through the windows. It wasn't protected where it was. It was on hooks over the fireplace. Um, and actually, some of the paint from the uh, mantle, or excuse me, from the paneling, 
behind it transferred over to the stock um, of the gun. So we really try not to leave things out for too long um, while also respecting the fact that a lot of things that we have out right now are the most important things. They are things that are really directly related. If anyone's visited Buckman, we have things in that exhibit case that are John Hancock's silk vest, um, Joshua Simon's wax relief, his bas relief, um, and his sword as well. Um, we have things like photographs of Jonathan Harrington, one of the uh, few Rev War soldiers who lived long enough to be photographed. Uh, we have the William Diamond drum, which is one of the, the big objects that we always talk about um, at the Historical Society. It was the drum used by the fife, or excuse me, by the drummer for the militia. We also have the receipt in our collections of the purchase of the drums about a month before, uh, a receipt from the Minuteman Training Band to the town of Lexington for those drums. Um, so there are some really amazing objects in the houses already, um, and that's in part why we don't swap them out with stuff that's in storage. But yeah, sometimes we do need to pull stuff from being on display and give it a rest in collection storage. Um, we have a lot of other objects that have been out and are, you know, taking a boot there basically in here. Anything um, like air, you know, uh, pollution, people touching things, brushing against things, it all creates instability for the objects. Um, so we rotate them out as needed. So. I think we're winding up. Like I said, if anyone is interested in any of the other programs that we have done this week, they are all available on the website. Um, it's been a labor of love for all of us working from home uh, to come in when we have or to you know, produce these videos from home. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, as many of you know. Uh, we get a lot of emotional support from the town of Lexington and other places, but uh, physical uh, our financial support for the organization comes from, well, viewers like you. Uh, comes from admissions to our historic houses, something that is not happening right now. We are working on a plan for reopening, but uh, due to current guidance, we are not going to be doing that, you know, tomorrow. But admissions to our historic houses, uh, donations, memberships, programs that we do, all of these things help uh, keep our operations running, help us keep the lights on, keep the heat on so we can take care of these objects help pay for you know, staff members to help uh, present these programs. So if you're feeling generous, um, if you're able to, obviously we know the virus has created a lot of uh, instability financially for a lot of people, but if you're able to, any donation counts, any donation is incredibly gratefully received. Um, and in order to do that, you can go to Lexington History backslash give. Um, if anyone has any questions, as I said, I will put my email address in the comments and you can uh, send those along to me. And I wanted to thank you all very much for joining us today uh, and happy end of Virtual Patriots Day. Thanks very much.